Hello, I'd like to discuss a clinical case in which we illustrate how challenging it might become to manage patients with treatment options which are limited. Before I start, these are my disclosures. I've received research grants and honoraria for lectures or advisory boards from the various companies that are listed here. Patients with limited treatment options in HIV therapy have been very often through a long time of treatment history, which also reflects the history of HIV medicine. Until the mid 19th, very often we used sequential treatments with inefficient drugs. This was followed then by the introduction of triple combinations and what we then called highly active antiretroviral therapy where we combined more efficient drugs right from the beginning when we started treatment. Unfortunately, these treatment combinations were also accompanied by various metabolic disturbances and changes in the body features, which were very stigmatizing and disturbing. This period then later was followed by the introduction of new drugs and new drug classes because still triple combinations were the full solution and answer to patients that had failed on various regimens and had accumulated resistance mutations. And these salvage regimens, the combinations of new drugs and drug classes were assessed in various clinical trials, which are listed here. And HIV medicine learned also new terms, triple class failure, and optimized background therapy, which for a long time were very important terms in HIV medicine. Even today, we use very often very efficient and single tablet regimens, but still HIV therapy, despite being highly effective, it is not perfect. As you can see here, even in clinical trials, over time, there is a significant proportion of patients that is not able to maintain full viral suppression. And that of course, in the face of a lifelong treatment may become an issue. And treatments that we use have different responses and success in different regions of the world. This is a comparison of a boosted protease inhibitor regimen to um, a single tablet regimen using alvitigravir in women. And as you can see, the overall response is very good. It even favors the single tablet regimen, but the responses were very different. They were much less sufficient in individuals coming from the US as compared to individuals coming from Uganda. And this illustrates that various reasons are determinants of the success of HIV treatment. These are patient-related factors, challenges to adhere, psychosocial factors, drug addictions or comorbidities, poor access to care or the costs that can't be covered, adverse events and issues with tolerability but also the accumulation of resistant strains due to prior virological failures. So viral factors that contribute to limited treatment options. And of course, drugs that we've used and we're using with suboptimal PK and pharmacodynamics, low genetic barriers or drug-drug interactions with other non-HIV drugs. If these factors come together, there is a clear risk that virological failure might occur. In the past, we have responded to this with rather uh, helpless attempts. We increased the number of drugs, we used double boosted protease inhibitors or in other drugs in order to achieve viral suppression. And of course, today we know that these attempts were useless and didn't work and we can't continue. On top of this, as our patients get older 
the function of various organ systems will decrease over time as we age. And this has impact on the resorption, the metabolization and excretion of drugs. And this together with comorbidities or comorbid medication can cause various challenges and limit treatment options. So the case I want to discuss with you is a 54-year-old female with initially advanced disease and a current body mass index of 24.3. Her HIV infection is known for many years and she had suffered from lipodystrophy syndromes due to her previous treatments. Her previous HIV therapy had consisted of various drugs that are listed here, including NRTIs, NNRTIs, and protease inhibitors. And she had various uh, treatment failures while receiving these combinations. When she presented first time in our patient clinic, she was on this regimen consisting of TDF, FTC, and boosted atazanavir with a CD4 cell count of 320 and a viral load of 1,200 copy, which is clearly a suboptimal constellation. When we performed a resistance test, a number, a number of different resistance mutations um, decreasing the activity of NRTIs uh, would occur. They're all listed here and you see that most or all of the NRTIs are not active um, antivirally um, using various different scores and algorithms. In terms of NNRTIs, currently we couldn't find any resistance mutations, but we knew that she had failed on viramune containing regimen. So we had to assume that also resistance mutations, decreasing the activity of these drugs would be present in this patient. And finally, protease inhibitors um, also uh, were less efficient, as you can see on the, based on the listed resistance mutations. There was only darunavir and tipranavir listed at the very bottom that were susceptible or which, could we, which we, uh, we could expect activity against the virus. So at that stage, a couple of years ago, we constructed a new antiretroviral regimen consisting of TDF, FTC, darunavir, ritonavir, and roltecavir, mainly to introduce two fully active drugs with the boosted PI and the integrase inhibitor, which we could expect to be fully active um, and try to achieve um, full viral suppression. And indeed, what you can see here on the next figure is that the viral load um, declined further and was maintained for many years with this regimen that we've changed, changed over time, as you will see in a second. And also CD4 cell count and percentages increased. While this initial sort of salvage regimen consisted of uh, various um, pills, uh, altogether seven different pills. We changed this over time to this single drug regimen in which we use the booster for the Elvitegravir to also boost the Darunavir. But as we've learned from the optimal trial, even those NRTI inhibitors were most likely not required in this regimen. So we switched that patient to dolotegravir, darunavir, and ritonavir to have a simple regimen, uh, which was fully suppressive and very well tolerated. More recently, the patient was diagnosed with a deep vein thrombosis. She was put on a Pixaban initially, which probably wasn't the best combination, as you can see here on the right-hand side. That drug has a strong interaction with darunavir and other boosted protease inhibitors, and is not a good combination. She wasn't kept on this combination for a long time because 
there was an underlying bad diagnosis most likely causing that thrombosis, which was an ovarian cancer, a high-grade serious carcinoma, which was found to be in an advanced stage, as so often with this sort of disease, not only restricted to the ovarian, but also infiltrating surrounding organs. The patient is now expecting six cycles of carboplatin and paclitexel every three weeks, which is one of the standard treatments in this condition. If we look at the interaction we can use uh, the Liverpool-based HIV drug interaction homepage as a source, we do see that some of these chemotherapies indeed interact with the current regimen. To illustrate this a bit more, carboplatin is not a major challenge. Alvitegravir fixed dose would be a challenge, but the patient is not on this regimen anymore. Paclitaxel is more challenging, as you can see. There is interactions that we have to expect with darunavir. The homepage here indicates that darunavir will increase the exposure of paclitaxel and the package insert even shows the opposite, just illustrating how complex these interactions may be. Interestingly also, the chemotherapy can lead to a decreased exposure of dulotegravir if given at the same time. And that of course creates a more complex and risky situation for this patient. So we can respond to these interactions by increasing the dosage of dolotegravir to twice daily um, administration. But the challenges will maintain and persist for darunavir, boosted darunavir, in terms of anticoagulation, where we can use vitamin K antagonists or use um, heparin um, derivatives for anticoagulation because the factor XI antagonists are not appropriate. At the same time, the runavir will persist to increase the pulsitexel exposure and may increase toxicity, which is um, a probable challenge in, in the near future. What else could we consider? We could consider either now or in the case of toxicity to replace the boosted PI by oral fostemsevir, a new attachment inhibitor, which is very well tolerated and where we don't have to expect any resistance mutations. Or we can add or replace darunavir with ibalizumab, which is a CD4 monoclonal antibody given biweekly as an infusion, which um, to some degree might interfere with the chemotherapy, which is given every three weeks and makes it uh, every uh, three weeks, which makes it more challenging for the patient to adhere to these regimens. And last not least, one should also uh, consider PCP prophylaxis as this patient is most likely going also in um, in suppression of the bone marrow and will drop with the CD4 cell counts over the next couple of weeks and months. So what this um, clinical case um, aims to illustrate is that despite um, fully suppressed regimen that we could maintain for many years, other circumstances like comorbidities the persistence of the resistant strains uh, in the latent reservoir and the drug-drug interactions with antiretrovirals may create a situation where these maintained viral suppression is put at risk and virologic failure can occur. And we might either um, have to change treatment here and use novel drug because Due to the pretreatment and the patient's history, there is very few other options that we can use to maintain fully suppression and to prevent disease progression. Thank you very much for listening.